So, are we ready to go? Not quite. Are you ready? Yeah, ready now? Yeah. Okay, so good morning everybody and a very warm welcome to you. Um, this is the second of three events for Refugee Week 2022 and they're part of an ongoing initiative at the OU to become a University of Sanctuary. Um, the events are organised by the OU, the Open University's Sanctuary Working Group and uh, we owe special thanks to Hazel and to Laura for helping organise the digital aspects. Um, before we start, I think it's a good moment, as it's Refugee Week, to celebrate our achievement as the Sanctuary Working Group at the OU and to remind everyone that the OU has launched 12 scholarships for asylum seekers and refugees. Now, that would mean that a successful applicant would be able to study at the OU for an entire undergraduate degree, part time it, as they're working over six years or more or full time. Um, and with and all the fees would be paid. So there are also 50 free places um, that have to be applied for. Um, for open access courses and those are for people who aren't quite ready to go to university but who would benefit from some study skills etc. So um, please <laughs> publicise these great opportunities widely. Hazel um, will put the link to the Sanctuary Scholarships in the chat and there'll also be further links at the end of the presentation. And the deadline is exactly in one month, 22nd of July. So please, please do circulate that to people far and wide. So at the same time as we want to celebrate our achievements, um, this year as the Sanctuary Working Group, our progress is baby step by baby step towards becoming a University of Sanctuary and these events and the partnerships that we're going to talk about today are a vital part of that journey and we hope that these dialogues that we're creating both within and across the university and with our, our trusted and, 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 and truly um, um, uh, partners who we truly appreciate that we hope that we'll continue these in fruitful ways. Okay, over to today's launch. We're truly delighted to launch the digital photographic exhibition um, called Identity Over Time. And the exhibition presents images by Swansea photographers that were created during a series of photography workshops. Um, during the pandemic, Spanish speakers from Swansea came together to explore the past, the present, the hopes for the future. And today we're going to introduce the digital exhibition with a short 15 minute film that focuses on the work and ideas of only four um, of a group of uh, some 20 people who participated in the workshops. So we, we hope that this film is a kind of tasty teaser that will encourage you to go on and to explore the digital exhibition. And there's links to that. And I think it is a truly remarkable exhibition because it captures, I think, the lives and cultures of care and solidarity that blossomed during the pandemic amidst growing inequalities and it really addresses the theme of Refugee Week 2022 which is healing. So without further ado I'm, I think we will watch the film and we should say a big thank you to all the participants in the workshop and to all of you present here today. We look forward to the question and answer session after the film.
Sorry, I can't hear anything. Have you started it?
<sighs> Thank you very much. Well, um, I hope you all enjoyed that film. Um, thanks to Tom Cheeseman who um, put it together. Just before we go into the um, discussion um, and the Q&A, um, I'd like to just say a few words about um, uh, the series of workshops because our group of about 20 people, they met from October 2021 to March 2022 and we all received training, we all shared various kinds of expertise, but mostly we received training in digital photography and we received that training from among the best and shared our experiences of migration, as you can see. And what was amazing, I think, was that um, it was this kind of role reversal between Humberto, who was the eminence Grise, a professional poet and photographer, but also, unfortunately, Charlie and Andrea can't be here today, but they were absolutely brilliant. And as digital natives, there was this role reversal where the younger generations were teaching some of the older members and we and exchanging skills. Um, so I just thought that that would be um, uh, important to mention. Now, um, I'm going to open the floor to uh, Q&A. Please put any questions you have in the chat. Um, and so uh, while I'm waiting for some questions to come from the audience, I thought it would be a good idea, perhaps because it's Refugee Week um, this week, and we know that it's quite silly in a way to have a refugee week, but every week should be a, a week in which we consider these issues. But nevertheless, it helps to focus our minds. And this year, the theme that we're asked to focus on is healing, trauma and the power of healing. And um, in some of the discussion, it'd be good to maybe pick up on this question of the role of arts and cultural projects in dealing with the scars of exile and trauma and separation and loss. And maybe I can start by asking a question to first to Humberto and then to Patricia. Humberto, um, you were a political refugee from Pinochet's regime. Um, and many of the key themes of your work, as you so beautifully explained, are to do with absence and uncertainty. And I just wondered if you could elaborate maybe on some of the points you made about what, how your art, whether it's poetry or, or photography, how is that shaped by your experiences as a refugee? And in what sense, has it been a healing experience? And finally, you kind of imply that the healing never end, uh, that the healing process never ends, but that you've discovered a different way of looking at it through art. So I wondered if you could say a little more about that, Humberto. Uh, well, somebody say somewhere that, that art not in itself, is a therapeutic uh, experience, you know. And um, it, any kind of art, you know, have that uh, ability, you know, and you can heal through through the through its practice. Uh, when we arrive here, in the beginning, uh, was difficult, but at the same time. Personally, when I arrived in the, uh, here in Swansea, we were a, a big Chilean community, you know, the people exile, in which they create, or all together we create an atmosphere to keep, you no, know, our identity alive, our language alive, you no, know, and have this exchange, you no, know, of experience because we are coming from the different parts of the country. And at the same time, create this um, environment to organize activities, you no, know, for the in solidarity with Chile, you no, know, 
to expand the knowledge about what is going on in Chile, you know, through dictatorship. Uh, in that practice, you know, uh, I start thinking because that was the time when I took photography more seriously. In a way, I was able to to have a camera to buy one a proper uh, camera you know, for myself. Then in the beginning, I said, well, what kind of photography are you going to produce? And uh, when I start with the working inside the chicken community, more, more or less in the documentary way. But after that, it was a very, very positive and very good experience. But keep me too busy. No, I have no time for, for reflection. About that, no? Then I try with um, um, landscape, you no know, uh, urban architecture, you no know, in general, and it was an amazing experience because you no know, to put the camera in front of the field, you no, know, and start thinking and give me the peace, you no, know, what we are looking for because uh, mentally we, we are not in, in good shape, you no, know. and uh, starting from there, you no, know, I realized that therapeutic uh, value, this kind of practice, you no? Know? And um, we were talking with the rest of the community, you no? Know, and the people, you know, started uh, realizing, you no? Know, uh, that thing, and even we have a choir, you know, a folk group, you no? Know, and we meet two or three times per week, you no? Know, thinking and uh, doing things like that. And I, then the experience in general, no, took this uh, this way. And um, later on, uh, I find, no, this uh, way to express myself, no, through the a workshop the college where I work, no, sent me about um, photography as a therapy, no. With the famous uh, Rosie, uh, Rosie Martin, no, in which um, did it, was it a, a kind of a new wave of photo to approach photography during the 70s, 80s, essentially, no, in which is, is to reenact a kind of the trauma you have, no, and um, was a, a kind of perform, and then to picture of that, no, and that's how the the they were working. And um, yes, I find that very, very interesting, very positive. But I am not in the performance side, no? Then I need to something else. And then I find this uh, kind of photo collage, no? To build photo collage. And um, uh, give me not only the the experience or the knowledge, you no, know, to refine the craft, but at the same time, you no, know, it try to represent in a small a rectangle, you no, know, the best way with the how we feel or how I feel, and um, after that, it was very interesting because. The images, you no, know, start coming to me, and usually when I was in the field trying to do some landscape or you no, know, a close-up of landscape, and um, allow me to to live more or less in peace with myself, and um, from there, I think we start um, um, producing work, you no. Know, and um, it was the same with with poetry. I think you no, know, no, was uh, that it was my the encounters. You know, I have every day with myself. You no, know, and uh, probably to selfish to say that, but uh, this is a certain point. I say, well, I can't uh, talk or say something. You no, know, if I have not experience in, in that. You no, know. and the, the only way is to share something. You no, know, and even to but sometimes uh, visually could be confusing or the, the poetry will be 
confusing in a way, but it's an invitation to to reflect, mm -hmm. to reflect you know, our our surrounding, you no, know, what is going on in our head, in our mind, you no, know, and how try to go forward. Because, uh, um, we've got some, uh, um, thank you, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we've got some really um, great questions coming in from the audience as well, which they'd like you okay. to address. Mm -hmm. And and um, although I, uh, I would love to continue listening, I want to make sure that people get um, to ask their questions. So Ahmed has asked, um, you know, you've talked um, so poignantly about the reunion with your mother and how uh, she she will stay with you forever as an image now, even though you only discovered what she looked like at the age of 70. So Ahmed, I think, is asking, how do you perceive home? How, how, where is home for you? Ahmed asks. That's a very good question and very challenging one, no? But uh, I have, from a very early age, I developed this sense of, of outsider, you know? In the beginning, when, when I was a child, you know, and later a teenager, it was a little bit complicated to me to try to understand that. And, um, but I don't know, I, I developed that, and that is my sense, you know, always, you know, I have no, home, I think, you see, even when they have one here now, but uh, they do not give me the sense of uh, feeling the place, you know, and, and, the, and because uh, at home with my wife, with the, all the children, it's a different thing, you no? Know? because inside is a Chilean and Latin American territory, you see, and uh, we deal with that all the time, no? with the in background music, for instance, we are talking in Spanish, no? and all our discussion is going on in, in Spanish. No? Then the, that gave me a sense of uh, identity. And the, when we left Chile and the, uh, the Chilean dictatorship took our passport away, no? we were uh, Without, without a country, without a home, you know? And um, we accept that, you know, for, for me, it wasn't difficult, that, you know? And uh, the experience of life, you know, it always has been, you know, a little bit outside of the line. That is my feeling. Probably I am wrong, you know? But that is my feeling, and that was the way I learned to live. To accept reality and explore my reality from that point of view. No? Thank, you. Uh, thank you. I mean, I think um, it's beautiful what you say um, when you say that you learnt to live a little bit outside the trauma and not to allow that to be the root of anything. So maybe now is a good time to also bring Patricia in. Um, Patricia, as you know, um, I think uh, in the film it was explained she runs, she's actually created the Ibero and Latin American Association of Wales. Um, so Patricia, um, one of the questions we've had here is, do you think that running through your life, through the workshops, past, present, future, um, has that created feelings of nostalgia for home? for you and um that's from constanza who also hello constanza took part in the workshops and she says that's what it did for her it created quite a lot of nostalgia patricia um, yes i think it did of course because it makes you um reflect upon different stages of your life and in particular, um, that photograph of, which was not one of the shown ones, but the photograph where I arrive in Heathrow Airport at four o'clock in the morning, and there is nobody about, and I am on my own, and this sense of desolation um, that I felt of complete loneliness, which I had never felt in my whole life before, um, stayed with me for a long time. 
and it made me feel very nostalgic. And when I was doing the selection of my photographs, of course, that moment came back and I could almost feel it because although I didn't come to this country as a refugee, I came voluntary to work with a um, postgraduate <clears throat> grant from the British Council. Um, sometimes the nostalgia now is because I feel in, ex in exile at times because I can't feel, I'm not feeling comfortable with what's going on in Colombia at different stages. There's a lot of violence, a lot of kidnappings, problems. And I miss Colombia a lot. I miss my family in particular. And yes, I think nostalgia was one of the um, feelings and sentiments that run throughout. Um, but I, I tend not to indulge or dull too much in it because it then it kind of depresses you and it makes you feel that you're creating a hole for yourself and then it gets very difficult to get out of that hole. So whenever I feel too nostalgic, I try to um, bring positive thoughts and create a balance and then uh, not allow that nostalgia to dominate too much or to make me feel miserable. <laughs> so, yeah. Thanks, Patricia. And Constanza replies, yes, it has created nostalgia for me because she says her heart is forever split, especially when she goes back and visits her hometown and comes back to the UK again. She feels a profound sadness leaving behind family and this sense of not belonging anywhere and nostalgia always being present. I'd like now to move on to another question by Shona. Hi Shona, good to see you here. And um, Shona says it's wonderful to hear and see, see the work created here. She's curious to know from Humberto and Patricia how you feel about the term refugee. Maybe you could begin. Um, Humberto. Well, the word refugee, the meaning, no, um, is depend how you define it. But it, I, I hear it in the last couple of weeks, I think, in which people is not happy with the with the term. You see, but. Uh, Personally, I think whatever the term it is, you no, know, you have to have a kind of a definition. What what you are, what is your situation here, you no, know, in in this country, and uh, in the end, you no, know, um, I don't know. Personally, for instance, I feel a refugee all the time, and even when now after all these years here, probably I'm not a refugee. You no, know, I am a British citizen, for instance. You see, and that's what the but this is for me the legal aspect of that, you no. Know? And I have the this feeling to, to be a refugee, you no. Know? Because um, if we give an, whatever other name, whatever other word we use, you see, as soon as we open our mouth, we realize something doesn't fit with the rest of the population or when the place we are, you no. Know? And um, and we need to to accept that because it's something we cannot change, no. Even when you are um, take course about the vocalization, for instance, uh, to refine your pronunciation, you always have the accent, no, the to be a foreigner, no. And that's a that's a is the way in which I see and I feel it. Thank you, Humberto. Um, I think you you make a very important point about we don't no human being can ever be defined by a term like refugee, although those experiences may be defining. And I think Patricia, you've made the point you might like to elaborate, which is that you don't have to be legally a refugee to feel like a ref a refugee if you if your country takes a direction that you can that alienates you would you like to comment that's right for me 
a refugee is a person who is seeking sanctuary, who is seeking refuge, and therefore is somebody who's got the right to have that refuge. And the person has chosen a place to go to seek their safety, and therefore they are where they arrive, uh, they should be welcome and they have the right to be welcome. And I think um, yes, it doesn't matter what term it is, but people have, unfortunately, to flee all sorts of difficult circumstances. Most of the time they do it involuntarily. I mean, they don't want to leave their countries. My experience is a lot of people would rather be home, go back home, but they can't. And so while they are abroad, and in this case here in Swansea, for example, I think it is the responsibility of all those who are settled here to welcome them, to make them feel at home as much as possible, to include them um, and to give them a hand to make their pathway a little bit less difficult, to open doors for them and to just show a sense of solidarity and, and, and love, really. <laughs> Thank you, um, Patricia. And I think, you know, the Ibero and Latin American Association of Wales, you've done absolutely brilliant work in, in cultivating a culture of welcome and hospitality. And I think, um, you know, just to add to what you've both said, one of the astounding things, I think, um, when you work very closely with um, uh, refugees, asylum seekers, people who are seeking sanctuary, is that you you can no longer you know um, accept the media headlines because if you only have experience through the media of what this refugee crisis is, you lose the humanity. And you lose, I mean, for example, your, the association, Patricia, I've met people from El Salvador, from Venezuela, people who have been chased by gangs, whose families have been murdered, who've been tortured, who we don't hear so much of those stories. And that's why through this work that we do, through artistic expression, um, we hope that some of those you know, the humanising of the experiences of those who are seeking sanctuary um, becomes more better understood. So I guess in response to your question, Shona, I think the question should be turned back and said, the term refugee is useful for whom and for what? And clearly it's more than a legal status. Olga, Olga has... Um, made a very interesting comment here as well. Uh, let me see. Yeah, she says, in my opinion, um, when you're finding an identity, uh, people who've come from another place, um, finding a new identity is very important. And she says she feels that we're more in a cosmopolitan age. Um, and she says, I feel that some decision should be found in the future, like some kind of mixed culture. Um, and she's hoping that these, I, I think what I understand from your comment, Olga, is that um, can we overcome the prejudice and the conflicts between different groups and move towards a more cosmopolitan future and what can projects like this teach us? Sh shall I start with uh, Patricia for this? Well as far as I'm concerned we are all human and that's the basis for any relationship and any project and anything that we do and it doesn't matter where you come from, what colour you are, uh, what status you have here or there or anywhere. Um, to my mind, the, the important thing is how we relate to each other at a particular moment in time. And therefore, a lot of other things that might be very important um, for uh, people individually, when they come to relate to others, um, we can overcome it <clears throat> because 
whether we live in a cosmopolitan city or not, or not, like Swansea, when I came here in 2000, was not very cosmopolitan. It has become so. Um, but it's not the city itself, it's people's mentality and, and how they feel. And I know for a fact that some local people feel, quotes, invaded by all these new foreigners because they make them feel they don't belong any longer if the shop, the, the corner shop is um, full of foreign foods. And so where are all my baked beans, you know? Um, and they feel a bit resentful against incoming people. And <laughs> that is, to my mind, a very narrow minded way of looking at things. Um, that corner shop is enriching the lives of people. Try new things, you know, and go a little bit farther on to get your baked beans. It's not a problem. And we enrich each other uh, when we come into contact with each other. And we all have our own history. And that interchange, intertwining our histories is what makes us very rich. Thank you, Patricia. Um, uh, Tom, I'd like to bring you in if um, if that's OK, if if you're there. Tom. Hi, Tom. Yeah, so Tom's Tom. Tom uh, is the treasurer at Swansea Asylum Support Group, Asylum Seeker Support Group. And um, there are a few related questions here. So on this question of um, defining a refugee, whether it's a useful term, and when does a person cease to be a refugee? You've worked for over 20 years in a kind of cosmopolitan ethos um, around um, the, the, the organisation Swansea Asylum Support. Um, would you like to address those questions and sp specifically respond to Ahmed, who says the term refugee is Western? in my view, when he fled his country, Syria, to Iraqi Kurdistan, he was called a guest. And um, I wondered if you could sh shed any insights of what you've gleaned over the last 20 years or so about the usefulness or not of these terms. For whom and why? So essentially, these are, it's, these, these are legal terms. Um, I, I don't know. I don't. I should probably know. I don't know much about the history of the term refugee, but it, you know, it really comes in after the war with the International Refugee Convention. It's 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 about international uh, international legal norms and um, the responsibilities that states take to protect people from other states. In this case, um, and then when people enter the UK as asylum seekers. Um, Various different terms are used, but for, for some people, you know, to become a refugee means the same as to get your papers, to get your status, to get a visa so that you have a, um, you know, you have a you have a secure future. So it's a kind of aspiration to be a refugee rather than to be an asylum seeker. But all of these terms are, you know, they have their origin in, in legal systems which are designed to, to control and um, to control and manage people. And ah Ahmed made the point that, you know, when he first crossed the border, went to the neighbouring country, he was regarded as a guest. And that's kind of lovely. But I don't know what happened, you know, the next border that he crossed. Um, you know, if you, if you go from there then into Turkey, are you still a guest? Um, depending where you came from in Turkey, are you regarded as a guest then? Or, you know, it's um, uh, these, these terms are... Um, you know, they all have their cultural limits for various reasons. They're all problematic, aren't they? And and I suppose there's a guest worker, the gastarbeiter, uh, the Turkish workers living in Germany, that the term guest then takes on a whole new set of connotations because that means you will never arrive at a state of uh, citizenship. Yeah, so thanks, thanks for that. And um, I guess just to finish, I mean, the uh, on the asylum seeker term, I mean, it is, it is a, from my understanding, I mean, a state of great suffering, distress, endurance, and 
and so being a, an asylum seeker is something that one a status one wants to end a legal status as you say but now over to Humberto because after your years of experience Fidel has asked an excellent question um, finally when does a person cease to be a refugee does one ever cease to be a refugee there is two two part you know in the experience of it, living this uh, first when you are legally a, a refugee you no know, and uh, after a while the process is going on you no know, and your state change why is that usually when you are integrate you no know, a part of the new country where you're living. That means officially you get a, prop, a, a job, you know, and you start from there, you develop a professional, you know, um, a activities now. The other is, well, that's when you get the, the, the legal uh, status, you know, but the other is how you feel, you know, uh, the feeling is of a refugee is a different thing, you know. For some reason, in my case, it never left me, you know. Because um, Gabriela, for instance, have a different experience, you know. She always, you know, she doesn't mention because she doesn't, I had the impression she doesn't feel a refugee anymore, you know. But uh, for me, it's a very, it's in my mind all the time. When I'm writing or when doing my photography, is more or less that is the background, you see, or the canvas where I start painting, you know, whatever I produce. Then I don't think that's the right thing to do. Probably uh, I am completely wrong, but that's my feeling. You know? And you are entitled to your feelings. I think you make a, a very good point about there is a legal definition, but there's how you feel as the affect and the social. Um, I wanted to go back to Fidel. I don't know, Fidel, if you would like to come in at this point. Fidel is a st stalwart member of our uh, sanctuary working group, and you yourself have been a refugee from Rwanda. Would you like to answer this question? <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot here a little bit, but Fidel, do you think you ever stop being a refugee? Do you ever feel that? And how do you respond to what Humberto has said? I have actually put something in the chat because uh, very clearly he distinguished, you know, the categorization, i.e. the labels we are ascribed as people and self-identification, i.e. how we feel about our own identity. Uh, but I mean, for me, I see myself actually as a, a global citizen, although it is an exercise which I keep, I keep working on because I don't want to be put in a box. I am a, a sort of a product of my journey, whether it was a journey which may have begun in Rwanda, gone to Kenya, uh, as a student, gone to Ireland, uh, became an Assam seeker, refugee, a citizen, and now I live in the UK. So my, I see me as a product of all that, and I don't like being boxed into one one group. Whatever very good definition I may be ascribed to. In other words, I am a Morocco citizen, and I believe I'm a Morocco citizen in a full sense. And I, I, nobody is going to push me around and uh, convince me that I'm something else. So that's a choice, though. And that's how I feel. Mm. And not everybody is on the same. If it is a continuum, not everybody is at the same level. And why should they? So if people feel nostalgic, we have to support them in their nostalgia. If they feel they are part of it, so be it. So, but as a society, you have to do more to make sure people feel at home, whether they are visitors, guests, whatever name we give them, while they are living with us, we should mm. encourage them to be part of us. 
And I suppose it's true to say with this new um, policy of sending people to Rwanda, your home country to, towards which you have very profoundly ambivalent feelings, um, the definitions of being an asylum seeker or refugee are changing. The goalposts are changing. Do you yeah, want to it, make yeah, any it, comment on no, that? It is moving all the time. And uh, my, my, my issue, my concern is people who are suffering being being played like a, fo a political football just for the sake of some political uh, sort of arrangement. That's why I feel a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit uneasy. So let's be upfront and say we are doing this for political reasons as opposed to humanitarian or legal reasons. And unfortunately, you know, people are being played and they are being used as a way of conveying some sort of subliminal messages. Some of them are subtle, others are overt, but most of them are covert. So let's be careful and figure out how we do it and remind the politicians that after all, behind those numbers, there are names, you know, whom we should care for. Thank you, Fidel. Um, I think we're going to um, draw things to a close. And isn't it wonderful that we've been able to um, open up the discussion, some very excellent um, comments coming in. And just to end, I just would like to, because I think it is really important to share with you um, the front, the, the, the page of our um, actual <laughs> photography exhibition. And uh, because what we haven't been able to do today is do justice to all the wonderful pictures um, and contributions that are made by all the, very, the different people who've been involved in this um, exhibition. And uh, to them, um, you know, we owe a great debt of thanks. Some of them are here, some are not. And we also owe a great debt of thanks to um, Patricia, for her wonderful partnership with the um, her association, to Humberto for his um, inspirational leadership round photography, and to and to our younger members who unfortunately can't be here because they're working, Andrea, and to Charlie who were absolutely brilliant. So. Um, Without further ado, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Thank you for your contributions. And um, I hope you might be able to join us tomorrow for our final um, event, uh, which promises to be equally fascinating, Blood and Gold. Bye bye for now. Thank you, Marie, for everything you've done. Great job. Pleasure. Pleasure. Bye now. Bye-bye.